Welcome to week three of Red Drops and Downs. We are doing SummerSlam 2013 thanks to you guys in the poll and of course to celebrate SummerSlam weekend. And make sure you keep your eyes out for the poll on Tuesday on that little community thread here on YouTube. Also, I have some lovely trivia to begin this week's episode because I was at SummerSlam 2013. Isn't that cool? Kinda. Also met Wade Barrett beforehand who was insistent that I was his mate Steve. I'm not kidding. He was like, oh, you sound like my mate Steve. I was like, Wade, I'm not... I'm not your mate Steve Gazoo, but you sound like him. So, you know, he's Wade Barrett, he's massive. I was like, yeah, all right, cool. I'll be your mate Steve. And then we went for a drink. That bit's a lie. Just to continue my asshole name dropping ways, and yeah, talking about going for a drink. Do you know who I actually did go for a drink with that weekend? The nature boy, Ric Flair. I'm not making this up. Hopefully I can find the picture as proof. But also I don't drink alcohols. He was looking at me like, you son of a gun. Now that bit's not true. He was a lovely man. He was very, very friendly. And also, just to fill you in on the rest of the scenario, there was also around about six other people there, and they basically talked to the 16-time world champion while I sat in the corner going, I don't know what's happening. So it does mean that I'm very biased towards this event, but it doesn't matter because it flipping rocks anyway. I mean, the two main events that were set up here, CM Punk versus Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan versus John Cena, they are the pivotal things coming together because you've got all the stories about CM Punk falling out with Paul Heyman and this like over looming dominance that the McMahon family is about to take over WWE once more. And by the end of the thing, oh, you know that's true. It also seems crazy now, knowing what we do know in hindsight, that Wild Wrestling Entertainment were still unsure on what they were going to do with Daniel Bryan. I mean, everybody in the world was like, well, that guy's a star. Push him to the moon, but they're like, mm, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe we should try and do something else. Crazy. And even at this point, nobody was quite sure if he actually was going to finally win the WWE Championship from John Cena, even though the man who can't be seen had injured his elbow. And that was so bad, he'd been taken off all house shows and been told, well, look, after the pay-per-view, you need to go and get surgery straight away. And when you see the strapping, or whatever you want to call it, that he is wearing here, that thing must have been the size of a damn golf ball. Raw and SmackDown were also constantly telling you, oh my gosh, Mr. Money in the Bank, Randy Orton, he's going to cash in here. Oh no, he's going to cash in there. So that was like in the atmosphere too. All of this was rocked and ready to go. It was also the weekend where you did indeed have the infamous WWE 2K panel hosted by Jim Ross with the nature boy Ric Flair and Stone Cold Steve Austin, where it is said that Ric Flair went so off script and went so crazy, and the fact that JR wasn't able to contain him, the good old JR lost his job. Now look, once again, I was at this panel, it's true, I was there, and everybody was having a laugh right, even the rattlesnake, who just looked at the nature boy the whole time with like hearts in his eyes, as if this guy's so funny, he's my hero. But apparently management didn't feel the same. Honestly, to this day, it still perplexes me, I thought we were all just having a joyous little bath together, figuratively speaking. So that has set the scene. Brace yourself, sit into your chair, and let's up those downs for SummerSlam 2013. The Miz does indeed kick off this show as the official host, and given that they called him the official host, you have to assume that there's an unofficial host, but we never found out who that was, so I will say that I, Simon Jeremy Miller, was the unofficial host of 2013 SummerSlam. Now, this kind of kicks off a pretty damn lame bit with The Miz, where he comes up going, oh, I'm great, before he gets interrupted by Fandango, who's dancing and doing all that Fandangoing stuff. This is before WWE rolled it into the ground. I'm not gonna lie, it kind of felt pointless. Also, out of context, it makes absolutely no sense. I know that context is important, but I always think this way. If you're a new fan, you think, oh, I'm gonna get the WWE Network, and you just stumble across SummerSlam 2013, you'd be like, Who's this wacko? It was also a very notable show because aside from NXT, Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family were also making their in-ring debut here as they took on Kane, wait for it, in an Inferno match. Although we weren't calling it an Inferno match anymore, now it was called a Ring of Fire match. I guess the word Inferno is too intense. It's great in many ways because you can just see the potential that Bray Wyatt has as a character, but yeah, when you watch the thing, well, it ain't that good. Down. The main reason for this is because it gets ruined straight away when we're told, oh, the winner is by pinfall or submission. So you're like, wait a minute, what? Pinfall or submission? If you can't set anybody on fire, what is the point of the damn flames? And then your brain goes, wait, wasn't Kane in an Inferno match in the late night? The Undertaker, he was set on fire. You're like, yes, brain, he was. I wanted to see a man burned. That's what I paid my money for. I mean, that's like the Olympics. The Olympic Games introducing a brand new event where it's the hurdles, but by the side of the track, 
is an alligator ready to kill him. You're like, well, look, if he's going to kill him, it needs to be put in a more threatening position. Put that damn alligator the other side of the hurdles. Not that I'm advocating for that, but it would be a pretty good spectacle. The build up to this is hilarious, too, because it's basically that Bray Wyatt, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan don't like Kane. So they just keep interrupting his matches and beating him up. Why not? And don't get me wrong, this is still a cool visual, but clearly in 2013, WWE was so terrified of somebody getting hurt, they didn't really do this justice. I mean, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan get a couple of weapons at one point, and they accidentally go into the fire, so they go up in smoke. But then there's firemen on hand to just blow them out with an extinguisher. It is just so disappointing. Wyatt also gets his ass whooped here until Harper and Roman are eventually able to get in there when they put the flames out with a blanket or something. And by the time they've done a number on The Undertaker's fake brother, Bray gave him the sister Abigail and he gets the one, two, three. I mean, now looking at it, what a great analogy this was for the entirety of this character's run. But what are you going to do? That's the start of SummerSlam. It's also such a messy finish. It comes out of nowhere. And the whole time you can just see the flames in the corner going, but don't you want to use me? The answer is no, no, we don't. Like a lonesome birthday party. And believe you me, I had plenty of those when I was a kid. Nobody turned up. Not that I, not that I care now. Afterwards, Rowan and Harper do indeed drag Kane's lifeless body. Bray Wyatt sits there in his rocking chair. And they slam the still steps into his head before they just take him away. They kind of kidnap him. And I don't think anybody explained where he went. I assume the Bray Wyatt shit. We then cut to the SummerSlam panel, complete with Shawn Michaels trying to act like what he had just seen was very perturbing and he was very worried. And we got a promo by Paul Heyman saying, you know what, we've got that little Brock Lesnar CM Punk match later. I think it should be no DQ. And I went, yeah. Never forget too, this is just when CM Punk and Heyman had broken up and it was a pretty big deal. Punk was going to win the money in the bank a few months earlier when Heyman had screwed him over because he just thought at this point Punk was nothing and he wasn't earning him any money, so he screwed him right over. He then brought back his other real friend, Brock Lesnar, who kicked the shib out of CM. I tell you what I did really love though, match number two, Cody Rhodes, we can say his last name here, versus Damien Sandow. I mean, talk about a window into what could have been. And it's hilarious straight away because Michael Toll tells us we should now cheer for Cody because he shaved his mustache off. And it doesn't make sense. That's more of a bad guy thing to do, but it's still the dumbest sentence you will ever hear in your life. Up. If you remember as well, they had been a partnership too. So many people falling out here, known as Team Road Scholars, which also Damien Sandow had ruined at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view when he had turned his back on Cody and stolen the briefcase for himself. Now, the former executive producer, whatever, AVW, didn't like that. So he took the thing and he threw it into the river. And I want WWE to start doing it again. Stone Cold Steve Austin always used to do it. The uh, Rock always used to do it. Cody was doing it. We should do it now. I want someone to get anything, a belt, Braun Strowman's beard, whatever. I don't care, chuck it into some water. Damien Sandow was devastated because he couldn't swim and I'll never understand why we pulled the plug on this because the intellectual savior of the masses character, he's so good because he's such a prick. He comes out here ragging on the audience and they hate him as much as they could hate anybody. And we were but a few months away, maybe even a few weeks, I'd have to check, when WWE just bungled his cash-in attempt and killed this guy dead. Ever since that point, everyone was like, what a loser you really are. You may be smart, but when it comes to the ring, you suck. And that was it, it was done. It's also fascinating to see Cody in a ring seven years ago, and although he was still pretty decent here, he has come along leaps and bounds. You can really see how much he's developed and you can see how much he's evolved. The fans are behind him here as well, so once again, it's another question as to why we didn't try and do more with him as well. And this is just a standard fun WWE match. Well, the finish does bring up a quick question, because obviously in match one, we'd seen the sister Abigail win the thing. And then in match two, Cody hits the crossroads, which wins the thing. But that's the same move. Why didn't we just stick something in between them? World champion Alberto Del Rio is out next. And oh man, is there a story to tell with this? Because all the rumors at the time suggested that Alberto and Drew McIntyre had gone out the night before. Somebody had said something nasty to the girl that Drew was dating. Alberto Del Rio was like, hey man, I used to fight MMA. I'll take you on and they beat the crap out of him and even apparently smashed a beer bottle into his face. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but Del Rio comes out here with the blackest of black eyes, so you gotta figure it's true. I mean, the commentators tried to cover it up with, oh, it's what Christian did to him. No, it is not. But that said, more power to him because despite all of that, he has a really good match with Christian here 
and I was surprised by how much I bought in. But just to give you another little bit of a chuckle, before all of this, our champion, the guy at the top, had lost to Randy Orton in a non-title match. And then he lost to Christian in a non-title match too. What a lousy champ. This wound up being a triple threat match between Randy Orton Christian and a returning RVD, but don't worry about him. He was just there, which Christian actually won. Hence why we're having this now, or seven years ago. Also, just to fill you in like Craig David, Christian used the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment to win that thing with a surprise roll-up, although it was more of a surprise backslide, but it goes to show the more things change, the more they stay the same. This was just such solid stuff, though. They're all focused around Christian's shoulder and Alberto going after that, because, of course, his finish is the cross arm breaker. And when Christian went for the spear, because, you know, his poor friend Edge had to retire. Edge, I love you. Thank you so much for making me the world champion. He wasn't able to make the cover. Alberto Del Rio did lock in that submission move, and Christian had to tap out. And the best thing about this is the fans are really upset by that. They really wanted to see Captain Charisma win. Del Rio somehow, though, by the end was kind of the good guy, I guess because in LA it has a big Hispanic community and the whole time he was shouting, see, see, so the crowd were going, see, see, but I like that too. It's like a game of tennis. Some guys are good, some guys are bad. It was then time for our Total Divas match, and that's not me making this up. It was completely based on the reality show, meaning if you didn't watch that thing, you had no clue as to what was going on. So it was Natalia with Naomi and Cameron in her corner, taking on Brie Bella with Nikki Bella and Evie Marie in hers. And look, WWE just does not care about the women's division here. You can't pretend otherwise. That's the truth, and it's a down. I tell you, the other reason for that down as well, Brie Bella's flipping entrance music. You know what I'm talking about. That horrible auto-tune thing that comes out the speakers. It makes me want to do terrible, terrible things. It's like nails on a chalkboard. Who thought this was a good idea? That when someone comes down the ramp beforehand, you hear like a monster is having some kind of transformation. I tell you the bizarre bit too. She doesn't even come out to that here. She comes out to you can look, but you can't touch. But it made me think about her entrance music and that was bad enough. The fans also don't care about this, which I kind of give them a little bit of a free pass on because WWE for years has been telling them not to care, but it still upsets my heart when they start chanting stuff like we want tables, we want Ryder, Michael Cole, JBL. They care about everything else but what is happening in the ring. Natty eventually won clean with the sharpshooter, and I tell you, the best bit is when she did come out with the functodactyls, their walk is perfectly in sync. Like, it's perfectly in sync, it made me feel really satisfied. Ryback was then in such a bizarre segment. He was backstage in catering, eating some soup, and he was mad at the catering guy because the soup was cold. He then turned to him and went, yeah, moron, didn't sound like that, he was all scared. But he was like, yeah, look, it's gazpacho soup, it's meant to be cold, and because Ryback felt stupid, he poured the soup on this guy's head. Just to make it doubly bad, he finished off by saying, feed me, moron, which was a play on his catchphrase. At this point, I don't remember how I felt about Ryback at the time, but I do know if I liked him, this would have been enough to make me go, I don't want to worry about that bald asshole. <laughs> That's a joke, you know what I'm saying. Anymore. Down. Then for the second week running, it's time to just pour a bunch of praise on CM Punk as he took on Brock Lesnar here. And I actually think this is the match of the night, and it's a close call because, of course, the main event between John Cena and Daniel Bryan is almost equally as perfect. But honestly, these two going at it is so damn good, and it's as good now as it was back then. I sound like I'm talking like I did last week. And the only reason that you shouldn't like this is if you're scared of words that rhyme with funk or lunk. Block is also a bad one, but is getting a golden up. Amazingly too, it was one of the matches that added to the many discrepancies that CM Punk had against Vince McMahon and WWE that would cause him to walk out of the company early in 2014. As Punk himself said though, when all was said and done, why the hell was he losing to Brock Lesnar when Brock Lesnar was about to go away? And on top of that, earlier in the year, he had lost to The Rock, who then went away. So what was CM Punk meant to do as a character? Because every time he had a big match, he found himself dead on his ass. And it's true, he did. So yeah, I really do get that, and he's not wrong, but here it's kind of different, because the performance is so good, and it's just so exciting and so entertaining to watch, I actually did feel like he was a bigger star by the end of it. And like I say, I'm in 2020, so I'm essentially a time traveler. On the message of Brock Lesnar 2, I'm just gonna say and get it out there, I absolutely think he's one of the best ever. When he is motivated, how can you not buy into this? He also comes out here the size of the house. I mean, he is absolutely massive. I can't figure how the hell he was able to get through 25 minutes at the end of this. I mean, he's completely red in the face, but I am 99% convinced he could have gone for another 30. 
The man, quite literally, is a beast. The last minute edition of the No DQ is also excellent because they just hit each other so hard, which makes you go, ah, I can't believe it. Including at one point CM Punk going to the top with a chair and elbowing it right into Brock Lesnar's face. Now CM Punk even holds back here like he had to do, but it will still make you feel like a terrible person and you didn't even do it. What? What's pretty awesome about it though is that there's just so many different attempts at the F5 and GTS, but the other guy keeps getting out of it as if they'd sat down the prior week watching tape going, well, I have to counter this and I have to counter that. It feels like a real fight. The near full spots are also spot on, especially Lesnar's, and I just said that so pff, I could blow more smoke up his ass. That's right, I really like Brock Lesnar. What we never talk about nowadays though, or at least I don't, is that technically Punk actually wins here when he finally does smash Lesnar with the GTS because he gets the pin, but Heyman gets in there at like 2.9462 to break this thing up. But I was like, wait a minute, something interesting or wacky happened in that. And I proceeded to watch this moment five times because I'm a massive nerd. But when you do do that, you see that Lesnar actually kind of kicks out at the same time, which makes you question what they were trying to get over here. Did Brock Lesnar really need to protect himself that much? But it really doesn't matter because one minute later, Brock goes for the F5 and CM Punk reverses it into a DDT. And I'm pretty sure I had kittens. Don't know what that means. People just say I had kittens, but I was having a good time. Heyman, of course, is the reason it all falls apart too, because when Punk has the Anaconda device locked in, he gets involved in a cut a long story short. After Brock has smacked Punk around with a chair for a while, he F5s him on said chair and he gets the one, two, three. But he looks like he's been through a war at the end of it. When Punk leaves, he looks genuinely disappointed. This is pro wrestling, people. All the emotion up the two nine. I don't know what that means, but it's out there. Then hilariously, WWE sent Big E and AJ Lee and Dolph Ziggler and Caitlyn to the ring. I mean, what the hell were they meant to do? This is like throwing a fish into a pit of lions. There is no way that fish is going to come out the other side the same person that they were. And it's also doubly confusing because WWE had actually invested a lot of story time into this, but here it was basically a buffer. Even still up. Because I tell you, it's all right. The crowd are absolutely into Dolph Ziggler, which is a wonderful thing to go back and watch. And after he does indeed get out of the big ending and hit Big E with a zigzag to get the one, two, three, they are really happy. You even see people smile. It also blew my mind because I was like, has Big E been in that company that long? And he has. But it also sums up my point, jumping back into the modern day, that he should be the universal champion before the end of 2020. We have waited long enough Let's make it happen. Before all of that went down as well, WWE also showed highlights from a ridiculous contest where somebody agreed to be big splashed by Mark Henry in order to win VIP SummerSlam tickets. Now, this would have been okay if they'd just dialed it down a bit, but they act like Mark Henry is gonna throw this dude off a building, and when he does give him the splash, obviously he takes as much care as he humanly could. This was stupid. On top of that, before we did get to our main event, for the third time, the third time, The Miz was saying something when Fandango just came in doing his ballroom dancing. And the big payoff to all of this was that Miz just punched him in the face. Down. It was then time for Daniel Bryan versus John Cena for the WWE title. And when we look back at this, surely this has to be considered as some kind of magic moment for Daniel Bryan. Because, you know, WWE were just so desperate to hold him down, but the fans just wanted to lift him up as they were doing here. It's like having a good friend at school who's like the nicest person ever, but also just so happens to be a phenomenal professional wrestler. And therefore, when you see them in the ring, you are desperate for them to win. It's also one of those matches, as already mentioned, where you think that Daniel Bryan's gonna win, but because he's taken on John Flipping Cena, you're not sure. And it was this close to getting a golden up. Now really, both of these matches should have been able to get a golden up, but you know my rules. It's one golden up a show max, not the Wrestling Observer star system. It does not get broken, but it's still an up. It's like a mega, mega, mega up. It is fabu, but yeah, it's getting up. The best part of the story is that someone at the root of it all is Brad Maddox, who at the time was the Raw general manager. Put your hands up if you remember Brad Maddox. I actually do. I quite liked him, but these days he ain't even a peep. Aside from some videos, we're not talking about it. But he did indeed let John Cena pick his opponent for SummerSlam, and he of course went for Daniel Bryan, and that pissed off Vince McMahon, who came out and went, but you look like a goat, and you're a vegan, and other stupid things that nobody should say. Also tried to make him shave his beard and put him in a gauntlet match. Oh no, not a gauntlet match. Please don't make me do my job that I'm employed to do. And the payoff was meant to be that Brad Maddox was gonna be the special guest referee at the pay-per-view, but instead Triple H turned up, pedigreed Brad and went, uh-uh, you a bad egg, I'll do it. 
Well, wouldn't you just know the bad egg was looking at us in the face? Not me. I know I like an egg. I'm talking about Triple H. Outside of all of that, this is just brilliant. And up there with not only one of John Cena's best matches, but also one of Daniel Bryan's, and that is saying something. But once again, like Money in the Bank 2011, it just comes down to atmosphere and how desperate the crowd are for Bryan to win. I'm pretty sure if you'd found one of them and said, look, I will go shoot a horse, but that horse dying means Daniel Bryan would win. They would go, oh, and they think about it, and that would make them a terrible person. Towards the end as well, my word, I think Bryan forgets where he is and transports himself back to the Indies, or if he's fighting for New Japan, because he goes for a Frankensteiner, John Cena catches him, and I think they're meant to do the Stars Clash, but instead, Cena just drives his head right into the floor. I mean, I think he realizes he screws up because he quickly goes into the STF, but it scared me so much, I collapsed, and then I had to ring my mum and let her know I was okay. And she's like, this call makes no sense. I didn't see you collapse. And yes, look, throughout this, you do see John Cena calling spots. I'm only saying that because otherwise the audience will call me out on it. I don't care. Let him do what he wants. He somehow manages to make things feel bigger than they are. There's also this great spot where they lose their temper and just start slapping each other around the face. And there's no way they didn't wake up the next day and feel absolutely terrible because they were laying it in. And at this point, you may be going, Simon, you haven't mentioned Triple H very much as the special guest referee, but that's by design. WWE was so clever here. He just painted himself into the background to the point, sometimes you forgot he was there. The first ending absolutely rocks too, because there's no shenanigans, there's no nonsense, there's no nothing. Just at one point, as the crowd is ready to explode, Daniel Bryan runs at John Cena, he knees him right at the face, which was his brand new finisher at the time, and to get it over, he pinned John Cena and became the WWE Champion. I knew this was gonna happen, and I was still happy. The amount of signs for this man as well is just wonderful. At this point, it kind of turned into one of those movies. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen the movie around about 22,000 times and you know it has a bad ending, but you sit there with the fingers crossed going, oh, maybe this time somehow the ending will change, even though that's not possible. And that's what I was doing here. I was like, please don't actually let Randy Orton come out. And the damn Viper was here. Because yes, after a crazy amount of celebrating and John Cena endorsing Daniel Bryan by shaking his hand, I have voices in my head, started to play over the tannoy and Mr. Money in the Bank came in to cash in his briefcase. Or did he? Because he firstly gets booed when he turns his back to the ring as if this was just a big tease and the commentators actually do really well here by doubling down on that. But as soon as he cranks his neck to look back at Daniel Bryan, Triple H attacks, he pedigreed him, Randy gets in the ring, pins the guy, one, two, three, and for the second time in around about three minutes, you've got yourself a brand new WWE Champion. And really, it's the start of the authority. Which meant we were off to the races towards WrestleMania 30, which of course was meant to be Batista versus Randy Orton, but Daniel Bryan, bless him, he would not let this happen. And all of this is so well-timed. Say what you want about WWE, they got this damn right. And of course, before we do end this week, Retro Ups and Downs, my name is Flippin' Marks from Kayfabe News. Make sure you check me out. And as one of only two reputable journalists in the wrestling world, everybody else is an absolute goon. I'm going to let you know Dave Meltzer's star ratings for SummerSlam 2013. The Inferno match got a dud because it sucked. Cody versus Sando got two stars. Del Rio versus Christian got three and a half stars. Natty versus Bree got one and a quarter stars. Brock versus Punk got four and a half stars. Ziggler, Katie versus Big E and AJ got two stars. And Brian versus John Cena got another four and a half stars. So take that and stick it up your pipe hole. A WWE paper event with two matches close to having a five star rating. What it means is, much like flipping marks, <laughs> it's better than you. You go get them, Dave. Wind them up. Puff, puff, I tell you, from start to finish, that is a hell of an event. And maybe in terms of the whole thing, could be the best one we've reviewed so far. And if you haven't seen it, go watch it. If you haven't seen it for a while, go watch it. That's how good it gets. Overall, don't think I've done this yet, moron, but it gets it up. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below, and don't forget that's how you get in the poll. I mean, this week we had a little bit of fun with it because it's SummerSlam weekend. Choose the show you want, and whichever ones get upvoted the most, they're the ones that will make it on Tuesday. Then like the video, share the video, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling. Make sure you go watch all the other retro ups and downs, support this content. Also, check out WhatCulture.com. Follow What Culture on Twitter, What Culture WWE. And yeah, after you're done with those retro ups and downs, Watch more videos on what culture. That's gibberish. See, I'm exhausted. My name is Simon from What Culture, also known as Mr. Ups and Downs. Let's go to sleep.